privilege to welcome you to the annual CMA Marston Lecture. As I have said several times in the past, we have the privilege of uh, in this lecture of remembering someone who's been who was associated with the university for uh, nearly half of its history. Uh, specifically, we have, and I would invite you this afternoon to pause to remember Professor C. May Marston, who during her own lifetime was known as the legend. She was born in 1877. And she attended high school in Alexander Hall at a time when it was known as the Seattle Seminary. And she graduated in 1898, which if you do the math, was seven years after the founding of this university, so almost from the very beginning. She earned her bachelor's degree from our sister school, Greenville College in Illinois, and her master's degree from the University of Washington. Professor Marston first joined the faculty at the newly christened Seattle Pacific College in 1902, where she taught Latin, Greek, English, French, and German for 56 years. At the 1952 uh, Seattle Pacific College graduation, she was giving an, given an honorary doctorate. And I'll read you a portion of the citation for the degree. We honor you as a teacher, a real teacher who has won your way into the hearts and lives of hundreds of young people. We honor you as a colleague, one who understands, one who is loyal and dependable. We honor you because of your sympathetic understanding and the modest yet effective manner in which you have insisted upon adhering to standards. We honor you for what you have meant to Seattle Pacific College through your multiplied gifts but we honor you most because of your fine Christian spirit, your exemplary life, your devotion to Christian education, and to the cross of Jesus Christ. This endowment, or the endowment, to support this lecture was given uh, by Dr. Marston's longtime friend and actually another legend in her own right, Dr. Winifred Weider. So we are extraordinarily grateful to these two amazing women uh, for their contribution to the legacy of SPU as we are extraordinarily grateful for our own colleague, Dr. Owen Newell, who will be, who holds the C. May Marston Professorship of Classics, and will be giving our address this evening. Thank you, Provost Van Duzer. Um, I have one additional anecdote about C. May Marston, which I received via email about a week ago from Dr. Wes Lindgren, many of you in here know, emeritus professor, and he wrote and told me, in the depths of the depression, when Seattle Pacific College was struggling financially, President C. Hoyt, C. Hoyt Watson borrowed $500 from Dr. Marston to make expenses meet during the summer when enrollments were low. She drove a solid bargain Somewhere between five to seven percent per annum, Watson paid it in full. So, not only did she know all those languages, she was also very astute with her investments and drove hard bargain. And so, for today's lecture, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Owen Ewald, another amazing and talented member of our faculty. He's an associate professor of classics, and over the past 15 years, He's taught Latin, Greek, ancient literature and translation, art history, and ancient history. He's taught in the University Scholars Program since 2008. The languages he can read include ancient Greek, Latin, French, German, Italian, Sanskrit, and English. His scholarship includes articles on aesthetics, historiography, poetics, and topography, as well as translations. His most recent work, published in the Bryn Mawr Classical Review, is a review of the Republican Aventine and Rome social order. Today we have the chance to hear Dr. Ewald speak about classical music and classical literature. I know we're in for a treat. Dr. Ewald? That, I guess I'll have to leave that one off. Okay. All right. 
Well, thanks, Margaret and Jeff. Um, thanks to the Center for Scholarship and Faculty Development, sponsor of this lecture. Thanks to Educational Technology and Media, members of the administration, um, my departmental colleagues for many years of support. And to students, especially from my classes and from capstones, and to community members. I also want to thank a random person on the internet who thinks I teach classical music, um, sends me links to his reviews and performances. These links nudge me to consider the relationship between classics and classical music. Maybe I do teach classical music after all, but I teach the roots rather than the fruits. So in this talk, I'm going to pluck and savor some of the fruits. Next. Most of the fruits will be excerpts from operas, but I want to mention a piece I teach in my freshman colloquium, Frank Ticelli's 1999 piece, Vesuvius. This short piece for concert band was inspired by the famous eruption of the mountain in 79 AD. This eruption preserved the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum under volcanic ash and threatened Neapolis, modern Naples. This eruption also inspired a 1985 painting by Andy Warhol, one of his last works, which provides a good visual aid for the dynamics of the eruption. Frank Ticelli has experience as a trumpet player and a high school band teacher, which means that the brass parts are interesting and that you do not need a massive orchestra to play his work. Ticelli's main subject is a ritual dance um, sacred to the god Bacchus, god of wine, theater, and ecstasy, which takes place during the eruption. But the energy of the eruption competes with the energy of the dance. Play, um, please play. <laughs> This piece is one of the more fun parts of the colloquium, and it sets up a really good discussion of how this eruption plays out across various art mediums, music, painting, etc. Next, please. But one of the most important uses of classics in the music is the genre of opera, which sees itself as a descendant of Greek tragedy, as a blend of drama and music. A little word origin journey here, opera comes from Latin opus, work, whose plural became a feminine noun, opera, operai, feminine effort since effort takes more than one work over time. The connection between opera and tragedy was made explicit in Venice in the 1600s, a group calling itself the Acad um, Academia degli Incogniti, or the School of the Unknowns, emphasized that opera should make use of well-known myths from epic and not deviate too much from their plots and characters. Also, the opera should observe the conventions of tragedy, such as having five acts with choral interludes in between, and the three unities of Aristotle, time within a 24-hour period, place, and action. Opera also works with two dynamics that are derived from tragedy, an, alterna an alternation between a type of rhythmic speech or recitative and arias um, as a or choral songs, more lyrical and expressive. Also, uh, many operas feature an alternation between main characters standing relatively still and group motion from the chorus or supporting characters. Next, please. An example of these principles is an opera, The Return of Ulysses, or Il Ritorno d'Ulisse, written by a member of the Academia, um, the librettist Giacomo Badoaro, based on the second half of the Odyssey, books 13 through 23, and first performed in 1640 at Venice Carnival, a festival held before Lent. There's a typical costume, and Carnival 2018 is going on right now as we speak. The Italian names are a bit different from Greek names, which may be confusing. In particular, the Greek hero Odysseus is called Ulysse in Italian, and his son Telemachus becomes Telemaco. Penelope, however, gets to keep her name and her declension. <laughs> <laughs> A quick plot summary. Odysseus has been gone for, um, for something like 20 years, 10 years for the Trojan War, and 10 years for sea travels and dalliances with goddesses. When he returns to Ithaca, which is a little smaller than San Juan Island, suitors are trying to marry his wife Penelope and take his place as king. After various tests of loyalty and identity, Odysseus kills almost all the suitors and reunites with Penelope. The first half of the Odyssey took about 10 years, but the second half takes place over a few days. Badawaro has compressed this to a single day to achieve Aristotelian unity of time. 
To secure unity of place, the action takes place almost entirely on the Greek island of Ithaca. Finally, the action is almost entirely concerned with, um, as the title indicates, the return, and not the previous or subsequent exploits of Ulysses. Next, please. In the original epic, the sufferings of Odysseus are summed up in the prologue, shown here. Sing to me of the man muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he had plundered the hallowed heights of Troy. Many cities of men he saw and learned their minds. Many pains he suffered, heart sick on the open sea, fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home. But he could not save them from disaster, hard as he strove. The recklessness of their own ways devoured, destroyed them all. The blind fools, they dev devoured the cattle of the sun, and the sun god blotted out the day of their return. Launch out on his story, muse daughter of Zeus. Start from where you will. Sing for our time, too. The epic um, begins in the middle with flashbacks and flash forwards, and specific episodes like the cattle of the sun get mentioned in the prologue. Also, Odysseus's men are mentioned here, but the opera picks up from a point um, after they have all died. Next, please. In contrast, the opera opens with the personifications of time, luck, and love, who sing in general terms about Odysseus's sufferings. Play, please. <laughs> This Monteverdi prologue is much more generalized because of the idea that Odysseus is an allegory for every person. Moreover, the libretto skips over most of the voyaging and mythological episodes to focus on Odysseus' struggle with humans rather than with gods. Next, please. Another view of Odysseus comes from his wife Penelope, who still laments and prays for him. She has also remained faithful against the advances of the suitors and worries that they will, they will kill her son Telemachus. Penelope says to her slaves, hear me, dear ones. Zeus has given me torment, me above all the others, born and bred in my day, my lion-hearted husband, lost long years ago, who excelled the Argives all in every strength. And a little later, she prays to the goddess Athena, hear me, daughter of Zeus, whose shield is thunder, tireless one, Athena, if ever here in his halls, resourceful King Odysseus, burn rich thighs of sheep or oxen in your honor, oh, remember it now for my sake, save my darling son, defend him from these outrageous, overbearing suitors. Again, note the mention of the evil suitors, who are not only trying to marry her, but also to kill her son Telemachus, to smooth their way to the throne. Next, please. In the opera, Penelope's lament focuses less on her husband Ulysses as a danger to his enemies than as a victim of fortune, which she tries to change. It may not be obvious, but the scene is recitative rather than aria. Penelope will not be able to sing a full-fledged aria until Ulysses returns near the end of the opera. Please play. Again, Penelope wants an exception from fate to bring Ulysses back from the sea. And the image of the wheel of fortune as a spinning wheel 
is especially appropriate since Penelope herself spins and weaves throughout the epic. The Venetian audience, which probably included women whose husbands were at sea for long periods of time, would have sympathized with Penelope's desire for her husband's return. Next, please. Meanwhile, the suitors, as it were, step up their game to get Penelope to marry one of them and to stop deferring her decision about which of them to marry. In Homer, the suitor Eurymachus in particular flatters Penelope to get her to choose a suitor, even though Eurymachus himself has already made Penelope's slave Melantho his concubine, an arrangement he plans to continue as Penelope's husband. He says, ah, daughter of Icarius, wise Penelope, if all the princes in Ionia and Argos saw you now, what a troop of suitors would banquet in your halls tomorrow at sunrise. You surpass all women in build and beauty, refined and steady mind. A little later, the suitors strut their stuff, or cut a rug, as it were, in Penelope's halls. <laughs> now the suitors turned to dance and song to the lovely beaten sway, waiting for dusk to come upon them there, and the dark night came upon them, lost in pleasure. The source material suggests to Monteverdi that it's time for a dance number, accompanied by this flattering song to Penelope. And the second half of the song is usually staged with dancing of some kind as the suitors sing as a group. Even though the suitors try with all their might to persuade Penelope to marry one of them, instead of waiting, she resists them strongly. Play, please. Not only the note of Penelope's suffering, but also you can hear even in the Italian, lots of no okay. in response to the suitors flattering and dancing. The suitors dancing as they sing also reflects the fact that Monteverdi, in his early career, um, he composed dances when he was at the court of the Gonzagas at Mantua. Monteverdi saw dancing as integral to music and to opera, as did ancient Greek tragedies. Next, please. But the genre of Greek tragedy also has its own constraints and limits. The scene in the Odyssey, where Odysseus kills almost all the suitors, is one of the most brutal scenes in world literature, perhaps comparable only to the final shootout of Western novels and films. But Greek tragedy does not allow onstage violence for religious reasons. So in the opera, Ulysses kills the suitors between acts and offstage. After the death of the suitors, what remains is the reunion of Odysseus and Penelope. And here's how it plays out in the Odyssey. After Penelope has, has proposed moving their marital bed, Odysseus describes how it is built on a tree stump and cannot be moved. And he also includes a physical description of how he built the bed. And, he, um, and here's the scene from the Odyssey. Then I lopped the leafy crown of the olive, clean cutting the stump bare from the roots up, planting it round with a bronze smoothing adze. I had the skill. I shaped it plumb to the line to make my bed post, bored the holes it needed with an auger. Working from there, I built my bed start to finish. I gave it ivory inlays, gold and silver fittings, wove the straps across it, outside gleaming red. There's our secret sign, I tell you, our life story. Does the bed, my lady, still stand planted firm? I don't know, or has someone chopped away that olive trunk and hauled our bedstead off? Living proof, Penelope felt her knees grow slack, her heart surrender, recognizing the strong, clear signs Odysseus offered. Most readings of the scene emphasize the bed frame made from an immovable, permanent olive stump as a symbol of the permanence of Odysseus and Penelope's relationship. The ancient epic considerably de-emphasizes the fact that Odysseus slept with two goddesses on his way home. 
Still, Odysseus has turned down an offer of immortality from one of the goddesses in order to come back to Penelope. Also, I want to point out here Odysseus's command of the other details, like the fitting and straps, which only someone who had made the bed and slept in it would know. Next, please. In the fifth act of Monteverdi's opera, the right number for a Greek tragedy, the story ends with a love duet. This aria includes the recognition and reunion of, Ulyss of Ulysses and Penelope. This love duet marks the first time that Penelope really breaks out into aria-level song. And Ellen Rosand has pointed out that a lot of the music in the aria recapitulates earlier music or resolves various kinds of musical tensions into a pleasing unity. Please play. <laughs> Note that there's much more recognition in this version on the textiles, um, not only to reflect um, the particular era, even to protect, reflect that particular city. Venice had a thriving textile industry at the time. Also, depicted on, um, on the fabrics are Diana the Virgin, a symbol of the fact um, that Penelope, though not a virgin, has remained chaste during Ulysses' absence. And it ends on a triumphant note of love not simply the reaction that Homer gives, um, but Penelope singing in full voice. In sum, this is an amazing adaptation and lays the groundwork not only for further adaptations of classical literature, but also for opera as we know it. Next, please. The next opera I will discuss is Les Troyennes, or The Trojans, by Hector Berlioz. Berlioz was introduced to the Aeneid by his father, who gave him a classical education. The basic plot is as follows. After the Trojans are defeated by the Greeks, Aeneas, prince of Troy, sails away to find a new home. After brief sojourns in Greece, Sicily, and Carthage, including a doomed romance with the Carthaginian queen Dido, Aeneas makes his way to central Italy. There he wages warfare against various kingdoms until he and his people are allowed to stay, and he marries Lavinia, daughter of King Latinus. Lavinia gets her own novel um, by the late Ursula Le Guin, but this opera will focus on the, much on the earlier parts. In fact, this, um, the story of Queen Dido and Prince Aeneas rescued Latin for Berlioz, who was struggling with it and found it tedious. But the romance captured his heart and imagination. According to Michael Rose, scholar of opera, Berlioz even fantasized about purchasing from the Ottoman Empire one of the islands mentioned in the Aeneid near the coast of Turkey, then sailing there with an orchestra and singers to put on his musical composition in the original setting. Berlioz worked on many other operas, but Princess Zane Wittgenstein in 1856 told him to be brave, to go ahead and write his opera about the Aeneid. It took Berlioz about two years to write until it premiered in Paris, but the opera sadly would not be performed in its full extent, un unabridged until 1890 in Stuttgart. Ber Berlioz brought to operatic life his much loved Aeneid, but focusing on the first half, or especially queen, before with Queen Dido. The opera has a five act structure, familiar from Monteverdi's Ulysse and from Greek tragedy. And again, stay tuned for contrasts between recitative and aria, between solo standing and choral motion. Nevertheless, Berlioz discards the three unities of Aristotle because of Berlioz's love of musical travel. Um, the Aeneid literally covers too much territory, and the opera moved from Troy in what's now Turkey to Carthage in what is now Tunisia, half the Mediterranean. Next, please. 
The role of Cassandra, a Trojan prophetess who is cursed with non-belief, is greatly expanded. The Aeneid describes her briefly, and a painting based partly on the opera shows Cassandra in prophetic distress as Troy burns. Virgil writes, then also Cassandra opens her mouth for our future doom, although never trusted by Trojans by the decree of a god. In the opera, Cassandra appears throughout the first two acts, interacting with the people of Troy. Okay, next, please. In this musical piece, she begs her husband Coribus, along with the other Trojans, to leave the city as soon as possible before it is destroyed. Cassandra and the orchestra not only sound the note of doom, but they also express the emotional anguish of knowing um, that Cassandra's loved ones will soon be dead and her beloved city burned to the ground. Next, please. After Aeneas flees to Carthage, Act 3 through 5 take place there, and Berlioz creates a musical interlude without singing to describe how Queen Dido of Carthage gives out awards to the construction workers who are building up her city. This interlude features group motion by the workers, and it was inspired by a description in Virgil's Aeneid Book One of how the workers build up Carthage. And I'm going to try to read you the lines from the Aeneid accompanied by Berlioz's music. Please play. The Tyrians press on with the work, some aligning the walls, struggling to raise the citadel, trundling stones up slopes, some picking the building sites and plowing out their boundaries, others drafting laws, electing judges, a senate held in awe. Here they're dredging a harbor. There they lay foundations deep for a theater, pouring out of great rock columns to form a fitting scene for stages still to come. Thank you. Next, please. But the most important thing that happens at Carthage um, is the romance of Prince Aeneas of Troy and Dido, Queen of Carthage. It culminates in the infamous cave scene in the Aeneid where Aeneas and Dido consummate their relationship. And down the mountain, gullies erupt in torrents. Dido and Troy's commander make their way to the same cave for shelter now. Primordial Earth and Juno, queen of marriage, give the signal and lightning torches flare, and the high sky bears witness to the wedding. Nymphs on the mountaintops wail out the wedding hymn. But the evil spirit, known as rumor or gossip, spreads this, as it were, tabloid version of their relationship. Here this Aeneas, born of Trojan blood, has arrived in Carthage, and lovely Dido deigns to join the man in wedlock. Even now they warm the winter, long as it lasts, with obscene desire, oblivious to their kingdoms, abject thralls of lust. Notice the negative spin and the lack of over-the-shoulder perspective. In these passages, we know what the gods think and what the Carthaginians think about this relationship, but not what the lovers themselves think. Next, please. Berlioz zooms in for a more personal view. Aeneas and Dido's falling in love takes most of Acts 3 and 4, and the culmination is this love duet, Nuit d'Ivresse, Night of Intoxication. Please play.
quite lovely. I'm also going to read in English two subsequent contributions by the lovers to this duet, which reframe the earlier ideals of love. Dida says, on such a night, crowned with golden laburnum, your mother Venus followed the fair Anchises to the groves of Mount Ida. And Aeneas replies, on such a night, headlong and joyous love, Troilus came to the foot of Troy's walls to await the lovely Cressida. Their love is passionate, but their examples are terrible. <laughs> Venus and Anchises conceive Aeneas, but then Anchises is struck lame with a bolt of lightning by Jove, king of the gods, and Venus returns to her husband Vulcan. Troilus waits for his beloved Cressida below the walls of Troy, but she gives his love token to his enemy, Diomedes. Next, please. These terrible examples foreshadow how Aeneas and Dido have literally the worst breakup in history. Before she commits suicide, Dido utters a curse against the future city of Rome, foreshadowing over a century of warfare between Rome and Carthage, known as the Punic Wars. Dido says, then you, O Trojans, train your offspring and all your future kin with hatreds, and send these gifts for my ashes. Let there be no love nor treaties for our peoples. Let some avenger rise from my bones, an avenger who can follow Trojan colonists with torch and sword, now or one day, at whatever time strength will offer itself. I pray for shores opposed to shores, waves opposed to waves, weapons to weapons. Let our very heirs fight. Shortly afterwards, Dido commits suicide on a funeral pyre that includes Aeneas' sword and clothing. Yet the Roman reader knows that her curse will come true. The avenger mentioned in the curse is the famous Carthaginian general Hannibal, who marched elephants over the Alps to bring his war to the outskirts of Rome. Next, please. Berlioz puts the curse after Dido's suicide to make her a more sympathetic character. Instead, a chorus of Carthaginian women delivers the curse to end the opera in its fifth act. Please play. Note how the vocabulary and even the word repetitions recall Dido's ferocious curse in the Aeneid. And even though this stirring chorus may sound somewhat happy to our ears, think of the trumpets as war trumpets, leading Napoleon or the Prussian Empire into your village. So just as Ritorno covers the second half of the Odyssey, Troyan covers the first half of the Aeneid. Ritorno shows the three unities, but Troyan covers more territory from Troy to Carthage. Next, please. The next opera I will discuss is Ariadne of Naxos, or Ariadne from Naxos, by Richard Strauss. I should stipulate that, um, that Strauss served the Nazi regime as Minister of Music during the 30s and 40s, but this work does not advocate Nazi ideology, and it's, this best version was performed in 1916, well before Hitler's rise to power. The opera is partly based on a play by the French author Moliere, Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, or The Wealthy Gentleman. This play satirizes Gatsby level, conspic conspicuous consumption. A nobleman is having a party with fireworks, um, and it has, the show has to take place at dusk at 9 p.m. He has also arranged for a comedy and an opera to be performed for his guests. Since there isn't time for the comedy and the opera to be performed one after the other, the nobleman orders them to be performed at the same time, like a two-ring circus. <laughs> this is not only a funny idea, but also a recognition that opera itself is a blending of genres. For Monteverdi, epic done in the style of tragedy. For Berlioz, epic done in a style of grand opera with elements of ballet. The prologue is not only a way to set up the collision of genres, but also to introduce the two sides, the dance teacher in Zerbinetta representing the comedy, and the music teacher in Ariadne representing the opera. You can hear the difference between, let's see, light bouncy comedy, followed by serious bombastic opera. Next, please. Please play. <laughs> Ah! 
So this musical dialogue clearly outlines the two sides, those who enjoy the dancing of Zerbinetta okay, and those who enjoy the arias of Ariadne. Also, its conversational recitative contrasts with the later arias of the opera. The mention of dancing also sets up later dancing by Zerbinetta and her four clowns, who are also her ex-boyfriends. <laughs> Next, please. Okay. While the myth of Ariadne is key to the opera, another important myth is the story of Echo. Because Echo distracts Juno while her husband Jove commits adultery, she is cursed with having to repeat the last word that someone else said, described here. One day, a young man um, named Narcissus hears Echo in the woods and calls out to her. He halts, astounded by that other voice. Here, let us come together, he cries out, and Echo gave her heart with her reply. Come, together. Narcissus, however, does not love her in return because he is the original narcissist in love with himself as the Steve LeBlanc painting suggests. Echo wastes away until only her voice is left in the original Ovidian myth. But in the opera, as a woman who falls in love unhappily, Echo's a natural companion for Ariadne, who is abandoned by her lover Theseus. In Ariadne of Noxus, she appears in the opening scene of the second act, which is the opera proper. With a naiad, a water spirit, and a dryad, a wood spirit, Echo surrounds the sleeping Ariadne, and she echoes what the others say. The next clip features actually literal echoes, both instrumental and vocal. And the German words here are probably not as important as the vocal effects. Please play. I hope the echoes were clearly heard. <laughs> okay. But yeah, both instrumental and vocal. After Ariadne wakes up, she laments her abandonment by Theseus and waits for death. Next, please. In the Odyssey, Hermes guides to the underworld the suitors whom Odysseus kills, as shown in this painting by Jan Stika. This painting is part of a series depicting events of the Odyssey, but it's relevant to other myths as well. The original um, scene in the Odyssey reads, now Kaleni and Hermes called away the suitor's ghosts, holding firm in his hand a wand of pure go fine gold that enchants the eyes of men whenever Hermes wants or wakes us from sleep. With a wave of this, he stirred and led them on. Next, please. So here, Ariadne describes herself as waiting for the god Hermes to show up and take her away to the underworld. Ariadne here shows intense emotion as she welcomes death. Even though Hermes and his wand are a very specific mythological reference, the image of dead souls as dry leaves is everywhere in the world literature, notably book six of Homer's Iliad. Next, please. To provide some comic relief to the audience and comfort to Ariadne, the dancer, comedian, Zerbinetta shows up and offers her advice. Get a new boyfriend, more wonderful than the last one. In this ex excerpt, she describes her experience of new love okay, in a comedic, upbeat way. Please play.
phrase, all sign God, or like a God, looks back to Ariadne's invocation of Hermes. The phrase also foreshadows Ariadne's impending rescue by the god Dionysus, also called Bacchus. Again, the, go the god of wine, ecstasy, and theater. Remember the Bacchic dance, paralleling the eruption into Shelley's Vesuvius. Next, please. The best version of this myth comes from Ovid, Metamorphoses, Book 8. But it compresses the myth into six poetic lines without any dialogue. Immediately, Theseus, with stolen Ariadne, set sail for Noxos and cruelly left his female companion on that shore. Dionysus brought help and embraces to her, who was abandoned and lamenting any things. And so that she would be famous in an eternal constellation, he took her crown from her forehead and put it into the sky. Astronomers will note that Ariadne's crown, now known as the Northern Crown, or Corona Borealis, is next to Hercules in the Northern Hemisphere. These two figures from Greco-Roman mythology, Hercules and Ariadne, are rare in being mortals who become gods, a move toward transcendence. Next, please. Although, even though the myth is very brief in its original, it was rather popular in opera from the very beginning. Monteverdi, whose Ulysse we heard earlier, also wrote an Ariadne, an Ari that is an Ariadne, earlier in his career based on the same myth. Strauss interprets this myth as offering hope that people can bounce back from low points, from being dumped, from, from the end of a romantic relationship, or can even rise above their misfortune to heaven. At the end of the opera, Bacchus sings to Ariadne words of love and reassurance. Please play. Note the allusion to the stars, to, and to Ariadne's crown being changed into a star. But more important is this new love, the transforming union between human and divine, reflected in a soaring aria. Next, please. Father M. Owen Lee, best known as an intermission commentator on the Metropolitan Opera radio broadcast, comments, Ariadne evokes virtually the whole history of opera, from its beginnings in the late Renaissance, when some Florentine scholars decided to put Greek myths on the stage, through its French and Italian development as tragic opera seria and comic opera buffa, to Mozart's 18th century Viennese fusion of the two, to 19th century Italian coloratura arias, to, in the final scene, German Wagner, his atonal chord, his mythic anticipations of Freud, and his evolutionary vision. Through the centuries, opera has survived by transforming itself. I hope that my talk so far has shown not only how classical literature has influenced classical music, but has also provided some additional support for Lee's remarks about self-transformation and evolution. Next, please. Now, if I could just persuade <laughs> Lin-Manuel Miranda to write a musical or opera based on Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, <laughs> for listening to me talk and play some delightful music, I thank you very much. Um, let's see, there are several settings of, especially the, the HD translations of Sappho. So, yeah, definitely. Sort of one, one lyric poet, okay, begets more lyric poetry. Yeah. Right. Or again, let, um, let's see, even though we no longer have the lyre music that went along with her poems, okay, modern composers have attempted to fill that gap. 
right? Because her her poetry mm -hmm. would have been sung, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Not all wor not all words. Music as well. It must have been hard to narrow down to which operas you were going to talk about. Sure. <laughs> and and works in general if you include things like personal side of Indias and, and all of that. Definitely. I wonder um, if you'd have any comments on Fuchs, Orfeo, and Eurydice. Oh, goodness, yes. I, I almost picked that one. Um, <laughs> right. Or, but I, I, I'd already talked about Orpheus in a previous lecture, so I, I covered a little bit of that territory before. But I'd say like that's for that I say that was really the only reason not to go there because there were some amazing arias there. Yeah, and um, and then the happy ending that there had to be. <laughs> right. Because of the time and place. Exactly. Whereas Ovid, not so much. Not yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Others? Yes. How did you decide which recordings to use? Oh. Um, part of it was, let's say, the ones that would be audible. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, some of the older ones are just too fuzzy. You know, that, and again, not that they're not um, great recordings, but um, or in particular, the Ariadne is Jesse Norman, and she's just one of the best Ariadnes ever. Yeah. Yes. Um, Dr. Dubold, I'm curious about um, maybe like some of the like. I don't know, like the work um, environment or like what some of these composers like Monteverdi, like um, did, did this person work like in a court or like in, um, in a government situation or was it more of like freelancing kind of thing or I'm curious to learn um, a little bit about that, about that context. Yeah, I think so Monteverdi began as court composer of the Gonzagas of Mantua. Like that, um, that school in Spokane is named for a member of that family. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and let's see, but fell out, you know, sort of there was a change of, of generation and he became much more freelance, okay? Or almost like a musical theater today, where sometimes um, you'll team up with a certain lyricist to write music, okay? Or someone, um, a lyricist will come to a composer with a book, sort of already finished, like, write music for this, please. And we think that's what happened with Badoara and Monteverdi. Okay? But again, it's very much kind of an up and down thing. It was, far from, it was far from certain that his work would be performed at the Venice Carnival. And there, or there was still a lot of competition. Yeah, where, I'd say whereas some of the, um, some of the later folks, um, I think Berlioz is a, rel a relatively successful composer. Somebody could make his living at it. And yeah, the end, Strauss, I'd say tragically, um, became, as it were, officially sponsored by the not, um, as Minister of Music. So I don't know if that, if that does kind of a little overview there or, yeah. yeah, yeah, different ways to, yeah, to get your work out there. Yeah. Yes? So Monteverdi also did a fair amount of work in the church. Thank you. Was there any kind of tension about sacred secular at that point? I think definitely, yeah, there, sure. Or that, uh, um, or again, there were, there were things, yeah, um, there were, yeah, there were things that were not permitted on stage or a certain amount of censorship, you know, as, as in Italy, well into the 20th century. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Or, and, and even just amongst that, a certain amount of competition between the two, you know, each wanting Monteverdi to write, to write them some more music. Yeah, I try to remember because I yeah I know some of the other things that have survived and they and even some of the things that have been rediscovered are more Monteverdi sacred music to balance that out. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about how it seems like most of the composers had to sort of interpret the old myths in some ways mm -hmm. in order to make it like acceptable or more popular for the time. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that you mentioned that like the people from the like academy sort of were interpreting it according to Aristotle, which still sort of, you know, Greek culture changed it. I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit more about what the interpretation from one culture to another looked like or how it changed kind of generally. Okay. 
Yeah, or that I'd, I'd say Aristotle almost got, as it were, canonized, you know, or made kind of the rule of art for that period. You know, so it, was impo it became very difficult to go against it. Yeah. Um, and we might even think that later, later um, opera composers had to grow out of it. Okay. Again, not to um, disrespect Aristotle, but again, you know, it's um, a particular kind of typology for even for another genre, tragedy. And so for opera, you might want to do different things, different effects, okay. yeah, changes of location. You might want to break those rules okay, as, um, as things go on. Or, or maybe in general, it becomes less Aristotelian with time. Thank you.